Today we're going to be continuing our series about singing a new song. And we've been going through the book of Psalms. Now we're not going to cover every psalm, uh, so don't get scared uh, because it would take me forever to get through 150 psalms. Um, And uh, so I'm not going to do that to you. But I've selected a few that help us out. Hey, you don't have to pause. That's me, brother. Hey, anytime you want to interrupt me to give them the offering, go right ahead. I ain't ever going to call you down on that. Hey, Amen. I just figured. Thank you. Uh, but we're we're continuing our series on singing a new song uh, because there's times in life where our attitude changes and shifts, and sometimes we become murmurers and complainers to God more than glorifiers of God. It's so easy to slip into, and I guarantee if we were all honest with one another this morning, we've all slipped over there a time or two. Uh, I know myself personally, I have to fight my flesh to slipping over there, uh, because immediately my flesh wants to go and and just look at the heavens and be like, why God, why me, why are you doing this to me? Um, it's easy to slip over there. It's easy to find ourselves on that side of the fence when it comes to God, uh, but it's a discipline to train ourselves to bring glory to God, even in the hardest of situations, even in the most challenging of times, we can sing a, a, a tune towards heaven that glorifies him and blesses him and strengthens us at the same time. So we're going to look at that through the book of Psalms. And, and today we're going to be looking at the third Psalm. If you, last week we covered the first Psalm, today we're going to cover the third Psalm because uh, it just speaks to, to me what so many people go through. But sometimes we feel like no one understands it. Um, how many of you have ever felt isolated before? Like you're going through something that nobody else is going through. We have all have. We all have. Uh, how many of you have ever been shocked when God reveals to you that you're not the only one who's gone through it? Yeah. Yeah. I've been there uh, talking to other minister friends of mine and talking to them. And they're like, man, I'm going through this. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I went through that last year. And, and, uh, and in a way, it makes you happy. Because you don't feel so alone. Um, like, misery loves company, and that's true. Uh, it's so true. Uh, if I'm miserable, I want everybody around me to be miserable. I don't want everybody else to have a happy day. Uh, but that's true. It's true of our flesh to say that. But what the devil tries to do in our lives, he tries to get us to a place where we feel like no one understands, not even God, what I'm going through, what I'm facing, the challenges of my life. Uh, no one understands. Nobody completely grasps where I'm at. Uh, and, and when the devil's really got the better of us, we even think that God doesn't understand or simply just doesn't care what we're going through. And that could be, that is the biggest lie, and that couldn't be more farther from the truth than what the Word of God proclaims to us. And here's the good news you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. And we're going to be talking about that today, about circumstances. James hit on it this morning, uh, and he didn't know what I was preaching today, uh, but you're going to hear a little overlap because what he was on is the same vibe that I'm th- going to be talking about today. But I want to read Psalm chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3. It's only eight verses long, but it's very, very powerful. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to go back and we'll discuss it. The Bible says this, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Salah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Salah. I laid me down and slept, I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Salah. Now, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to, for just a moment, just a moment, I'm asking you this morning to be real, and just take off your church halo and be the real you, and understand this is reality, and this is what happens in life. No one gets brownie points for hiding situations from everybody else to make us think that we're not all the same. We are all the same. We are all the same. We may have different positions in the body of Christ. We may have different things. But guys, when it comes to life, when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to the battles we face every day, no one is exempt. We're all the same. 
Uh, so don't think that some of us, some of us may have fought that battle last year, or what you're going today, may, we may not face it until five years down the road from now. But eventually, life is going to hit you. Eventually, you're going to find valleys. You're going to find storms. Eventually, you're going to find trouble. And it doesn't matter how churchy you can be. It doesn't matter how many times you can have attendance or how many times you can give money or how many times you can read your Bible or pray or all the things that we think that justify us to have a better life. All these things don't matter when it comes to life because it's going to hit you. It's going to hit us all. Well, David was there long before we were, and he had enough sense about him to write it down in a psalm. He says, uh, at this time of his life, it's, it's, it's believed that this is the time of his life when David wrote this, and when Absalom, his son, was rebelling against him uh, and bringing out an army against him. Now, that's a bad day when your son wants to kill you and take your throne from you. That's a bad day. Um, that's a really bad day. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure David has felt and then he, and he brings it out in this psalm, he feels like all the odds are stacked against him. Because what else could he do? He's doing what he's trying to do. He's trying to fulfill the, 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 the calling that God has put on his life to be king, to, to be able to stand into the throne. And it seems like the more and more he's king, the more problems he faces. And things just keep snowballing. And finally he gets to this point and the Holy Spirit leads him to write this psalm. And we're going to talk about it. He says in verse 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. How many of you have ever felt that you are outnumbered? Outnumbered. I'm outnumbered. I stand alone over here. Uh, and everyone else is against me. <laughs> uh, and all of my friends are against me. And all my family is against me. And it seems like... The earth itself is against me, and there is some force that I just can't break through because everything is against me. You're not alone. You're not the first to stand there. You're not the first person to feel like that. You're not the first person in history to step back and look and say, wow, there is no one on my side. There is nobody here to help me in this moment. But see, that is where, luckily the psalm doesn't end there. He keeps going. But, but I want to talk about this situation right now. How many of you have ever said, life's not fair? How many of you ever told people that advice? I say it to my children all the time. That's not fair. Life's not fair. Life in itself is not fair. And it's not fair for Christians the same way it's not fair for sinners. Nowhere in the Bible does God promise that life is going to be fair. It's not. Sometimes sinners are going to get blessings that you and I will never get. Sometimes they will have doors open for them that you and I will never have open for them. Sometimes life isn't going to go the way we think it should go. And, and by every rights we can stand and say, that's not fair. I'm doing what I'm supposed to and they are not. Well, that's life. That is life. But somewhere along the lines, as Christians have, have uh, evolved into whatever they are today, uh, whatever a Christian is defined today, because it gets farther and farther away from the truth every generation, it seems. But whatever Christianity has become today, somehow we got twisted where if we are Christians and we accept Christ in our life, then everything is going to be fair and everything is going to work out for our benefit and we're never going to have problems or issues or struggles. And if we do, then somehow God is mad at us or we've sinned and made a mistake or something along those lines. That is not the Bible. That is not biblical at all. Some of the greatest men and women in this Word, if you go and study your Word, they fought struggles most of their story. They constantly felt like they were beating their head against a wall. They were constantly in pain. They were constantly in struggle. They were constantly in a war for their own soul and for the cause of Christ. They were constantly in it. But here's the thing. I love the fact that the Bible mentions all that stuff. But the Bible is also there to tell us that in the midst of all of that, God is with them. In the midst of all of that, God is standing on their side. In the midst of all of that, Jesus is there to help them and to aid them in everything they're going through. 
God never promised you to never have a bad day. You're going to have a bad day. Sometimes bad days stretch into bad months. And sometimes bad months stretch into bad years. And it doesn't mean that God has forsaken us. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten us. And it doesn't mean that we have to put on this tune and sing a song towards heaven that God, you don't love me and you don't care what I'm going through. And, and you see all this stuff and you promised me all this stuff. Be careful what you claim God has promised you. Amen? Because if you can't get it out of here, he didn't promise it to you. <laughs> Amen? Just because some joker on TV promised you something, doesn't mean God promised you something. Read the word and stand on the promises of God. We can stand on those forever. Amen? But don't take it for granted that God has suddenly forgotten us and somehow we we come to a default setting on the wrong side of the fence and we're constantly in battle with God like somehow we've got to trick God or do enough things for God or jump through enough hoops for God in order for Him to bless us. That's not biblical. It's nowhere in there. I'm sorry, it's not. Now, does God bless those that seek Him? Yeah. Yeah, He does. Does God bless those that give their whole heart to Him? And, and yes, yes, He does. Yes, there are benefits to doing what God asks us to do. But understand, in this first verse, we've all stood in this place where we look around and say, I'm outnumbered. I'm outnumbered in my finances. I'm outnumbered in my marriage. I'm outnumbered with my kids. I'm outnumbered at the job. I'm outnumbered with my spiritual walk. I'm outnumbered with everything I do. It seems like there's more th coming against me than there is working for me. Well, sometimes that's the default in life. Sorry, I know that's a bummer. But that's the truth. Sometimes that's the default of life. And, and I wish I could tell you that it changes and it's different, but it doesn't. What changes is the power that works in us. Amen? That's what changes. That's what changes our tune. He says, there are many that rise up against me. And listen what they say. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. No help for him in God. And then it says, Salah. Now, Salah is like a musical term. You'll see that in the book of Psalms a lot. Salah, Salah. What it means is a musical, uh, like a, I guess you'd say like a solo, like a music solo, like a break, like it's just a um, cool melody. And it's put in there to make the song sound good and, and to make those things. But also the reason why the psalmist back then would put those things Salah is because it was meant for the people to ponder what was just said. To think about it. To stop. While the melody's going, you don't have to worry about singing the words. <laughs> you can think about the words. So whenever you see that salah, think about what was just said in the word of God. It'll help you. There is no help for him in God. Think about that statement. Because sometimes we've got to wake up and realize there is help for us in God. You say, well, I've always known that. I've never thought of that. When's the last time you were in trouble and you turned to God first? And you hit your knees first. And you went to the word first. Because if there's help for you in God, that's where you run to. But if your last resort is God, then what that tells God is, the only time I can really count on God is when I'm really up against it. And, and when I've exhausted all of my effort, then I can pray. Then I can turn to God. Then when I've done everything I can do, then I'll turn it over to God. Guys, that is not the way to live your Christian life. That is not. I don't know where that practice is. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it got in the church. But I've heard mighty Christian people that I've respected a lot say things like, well, I've done everything I can do. I guess I'm just going to pray. Really? That's not a good song towards heaven. That's not, a, that's not confidence in somebody. I wouldn't want you to come to me and be like, well, you know, I've tried to do this, Pastor. I've tried to do this, and I've asked that guy to do it, and I've asked this person to do it, and I went to everybody before you, and I guess I'm down to you. That makes me feel real good that I was your last resort. That I had so many other things that I would like to try, but when it's all spells, I guess we're just stuck with Pastor. 
you don't, no one would like that. You wouldn't want me to treat you like that. But why do we think we can treat God like that and all of a sudden God is just going to burst on the scene? He's telling you to think about that statement. There are people out there that go to tell you that you can't just sit back and put things in the hands of God. There are people that are going to tell you that. There are people who are going to tell you that we well, can't just put up, what are you going to do? Just put all your faith in God? I've heard people tell me that. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because that's what works. Is when all my faith is in Him. That's what really moves the mountain. That's what really gets a response from heaven. Is when I say, you know what, God? I am going to give it to you. I'm going to take this burden. I'm going to take this mountain, this giant, this whatever. See, I've got a cross. Whatever it is, God, I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it in your hands. And I'm going to believe that you are the God that I read in my word. I'm going to believe that you are the God that is for me, like James preached, or t- taught this morning. And that we've read and we've sung about that he's a great God and he's an awesome God and he's a powerful God and all of these things. I'm going to believe that with my whole heart. And I'm going to really put it in your hands. And I'm going to say, God, it's there it's yours and now God you tell me what my next step should be that's faith that moves mountains that's faith that gets you through that's the tune heaven would like to hear from us on a daily basis not that God I've called all my friends and don't have an answer I went around the world looking for an answer and I don't have anything so God here's my Hail Mary pass towards heaven hope you catch it God guys that's 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 Twisted. It's not the way it should be. So he's telling us, think about this. Think about that statement. There is no help for him in God. Verse 3, and James spoke about this out there. But God. I'm not saying you're a bad person if you've ever done that. We've all made that mistake. We've all done that. All of us have been there. But we've got to get to verse 3. We've got to stop living in verse 1 and 2 and singing that pitiful song towards heaven. And we got to get into verse 3, where God steps in. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Shield. A shield is a vital thing. Shield, we can always equate it with our faith because it's the shield of faith. But just a shield, something that stands between me and it. Something there. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will lift up a standard against it. Guys, you're not out there uh, facing the, the storm alone. You're not out there facing the flood of hell coming against you by yourself. If you will put faith in God, God will lift up a standard. He's still the same God that tells the ocean to stop. He's still the same God that tells the sun not to move. He's still the same God that hangs the stars in the sky. He's still that God. He has control over the circumstance if we will put our faith in Him and say, God, I know, what do I have to do? I don't have to do nothing but stand and stand there for. I will stand right here in my faith in God and God will bring up the petition between me and it. He will bring up the barrier. It's not going to overtake me. It's not going to overcome me. It's not going to take everything away from me that God has sown into my life. God, the Bible tells us, God said of Israel, and it applies just same to us as it did to them. God told Israel, He said, I will be a wall of fire round about you and the glory within you. That's awesome to me. That's awesome to me. What that tells me is when it feels like life is unfair and when it feels like the enemy is everywhere coming in against me and it feels like I'm being pushed into this really small, small space of doubt and despair and worry and fear and it feels like I just want to lay on the floor and cry and it's okay. If you feel that way, do it sometimes. It may help you. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just telling you that when when these circumstances come and they come in like a flood, we've got to have faith that they can only come this far. They can't overtake me. They can't take away Jesus from me. There's something between me and the attacker. There's something against uh, something between me and the devil and what his schemes and his plans are. The devil can scheme and plan all he wants to but his weapon will not will, will not prosper against me. Why? Because I'm a child of God and I put my faith in God alone. And when I stand there there. God will lift up that petition. He'll be my shield between me and it. 
But how often do we let the devil back us up into a corner just by saying boo? Just by saying, "Uh uh-huh, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? If the problems come, issues, where where are you going to run to now? The thing is, I don't have to run anywhere. I can stand. Right in the faith that got me to where I'm at. The same faith that got me to the mountaintop will keep me in the valley. The same faith that I walked in to victory so many times is the same faith that will keep me when it feels like all hope is lost. But we've got to train ourselves to sing that tune towards heaven. To stand there. It makes me feel good. Because not only did he say he's a shield for me, but the next part of that verse says, my glory. My glory. This part hit me heavy. Because I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't think a lot of myself. When it comes to my talents and my abilities, I always think, man, sooner or later they're going to realize I don't belong here and they're going to kick me out of the preaching club. They're going to kick me out of the pastor club. They're going to kick me out of this because I don't belong here. There's so many other people that do this better than me. There's so many other people out there that that you can tell that they've got so much more than I got. They can play. They can sing. They can write. They can do all these different things. I can't do that. I don't bring that to the table. And what the devil likes to do in my life, and I know he does it in your life, he begins to whisper in our ear that, you know what, you're nothing and you're nobody. Why would God come to your aid? There's so many other people that rank ahead of you. And and why would God do the miraculous for you in your life? Because look at where you're at right now. Do you think you really matter to God? Do you think your life really matters? It's not like you're a biblical character. It's not like you're somebody great. You don't have a world wide ministry. You don't have a thing. Why would God care about you? This is where we have to come and say, God, you are my glory. What does it mean? Glory in this, in, the, in this, uh, uh, there's two different, two different interpretations of glory. Same word, uh, means the same really, but, but there's the Hebrew and then there's Greek. The Hebrew word that he uses right here, uh, and I, I like it because it, uh, uh, it's called kabod. Kabod is how you say it. Kabod. And it reminds me of kapow. <laughs> That's mine. Kapow. Boom. Kapow. It's an explosion. It's explosion. Now, that's not what it means. <laughs> that's my, my definition, what it means. Because that's the way I make sense of it. But kabod in the Hebrew tongue means the weight of splendor and gifts. The weight of splendor and gifts. When I look at my life, I don't see through my eyes a lot of splendor and a lot of ability and talent and gifts. I don't see it. It's not to my perception. It doesn't make sense to me. I look in the mirror and be like, oh, man, you're a wreck. Yeah, that's what I look like. I mean, that's what I look at. I look in the mirror and be like, boy, boy, you got a long ways to go. But see, when the Bible says that he's my glory, when the devil starts whispering at us that we are nothing, when the, when the devil starts whispering at you that why would God help the lowly like you? Why would God step in for somebody like you? How many times have you made a mistake? How many times have you messed up? Then I have to realize that he is my glory. I am somebody not because of who I am and what I've done. I am somebody because of what he has done and who he is. That is where my glory comes from. That is where my position in life comes from. When I can stand up and stand up tall and say, I am a child of God. I can say that not because I've gone to church, not because I ran to an altar and shed some tears or got dunked in water. It goes beyond that. I'm a child of God because His glory now rests inside of me. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't do anything to acquire it. All I did was call out His name and He came and He took my penalty. He took took my shame. He took all of my inadequate things that I feel horrible about myself and he took it and he nailed it to his cross so I don't have to feel like that anymore. I don't have to feel like I'm the lowliest of the low. I can lift myself myself up and say I am the head and not the tail. I don't have to be last in line in life when it comes to God. Does that mean everything rolls my way? No. There's a lot of obstacles out there but in the middle of the obstacle I can lift my head up in heaven and say 
I know I belong to you and you belong to me. And I know that what I think of myself pales to extremely in the comparison of what you think of me. Because he found enough value in you to go to a cross and die for you. He found enough value and splendor in your life and enough talent and ability to put you into the kingdom of God and to give you a purpose because the kingdom wouldn't be the same without you. That's how important you are to God. That's how important your life is. You may look at your life and say, I'll never amount to anything. What you don't realize is you've already amounted to more than you could fathom. You you exist today because God Almighty thought of you in His mind and said, I need you in my kingdom. It wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be perfection without you. I've got to create you because you are the thing that I love the most. Man, it makes you kapow. Kabod is the word. But it sets off a cannon in my heart. Why? Because I realize it doesn't matter what people say about me. It doesn't matter the opinion of the world. It doesn't matter what people think. All that matters is what God has already testified to me. Testified to you this morning. If you'll hear him, you are so valuable. The weight the value of your splendor and your gifts and your abilities. God saw enough in you to die for you. He put enough in you and I to die for us. What a tune I can sing now. I can sing victory in Jesus now. Why? And mean it. Because the victory isn't about me. It's about Him. It's a new song. He says, you're the shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. This to me deals with my shame and my past. My shame and my past. I feel like James, I've done some stuff that would make a sailor blush. I've done some stuff that is pure wicked and evil. Wicked and evil. In my own life. Was I raised in a Christian home? Yeah, I was. My mom's right there. Ask her. I didn't miss church when I was young. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. I had to be there. Whether I wanted to or not. I've heard more sermons in my life than a lot of people. From a lot of different places. More Sunday school lessons. More Bible studies. More whatever. Than a lot of people. And even though I had 18 years of that. 18 years. When I got up to be a certain place, I was like, I'm going to do my own thing. And I rebelled against all of it. Rebelled against all of it. i got to share a personal story with you. And and I hope it's not to brag about me, but it's about to brag on my Jesus. Because when I think of the stupid things I've done, yeah, I drank a lot. I got high a lot. I did a lot of stupid stuff with drugs and alcohol. Stupid things that I wish I regret. But the most sinister and vile thing I think I ever did towards God was when I lived in Raynell, I didn't go to church. But in that church at Raynell, my aunt was the clerk, Clara. Mom and dad had already moved up and everything. I needed a ride somewhere one day. Clara was nice enough to give me a ride. And when she's going right there, there's an offering plate right there, and it's full of church money, tithe, offering. And I stole it. I took it. Why? Because I wanted to get high. I wanted to get high. I wanted to go and sin. So I took money, stole literally from God to go feed my habit and my sinner lifestyle. The fact that I'm standing here today as an ambassador for His glory tells you there's nothing you can do that God can't forgive and God can't redeem and God can't turn around for His glory sake. I regret it every day of my life. I regret it often. And God has to remind me often that I've forgiven you and it's behind you and let it go. But it still haunts me to this day. And God has a way of paying things back because later on, that same church that I stole that money from, when I got in the ministry, I was their youth pastor for years and built a youth ministry right there in that church. God has a way of bringing things back around and making it good for His glory's sake. 
What I'm trying to tell you is that, yeah, there's going to be times where you can hang your head down and feel sorry for yourself and say, man, I blew it. I messed up and God hates me now. He doesn't hate you. He loves you beyond measure. You can't measure his love, not even with the span of the universe. You cannot measure how much he thinks of you and what he has planned for you and what he's got in store for you. If you'll just hold on in faith and believe and say, God, I know you can make this wrong and make it right. I don't care what you did or how vile your story is. God can put it in your past and keep it there so that you can lift up your head and say proudly, I am a child of God. I am a part of Him. I am redeemed. I don't stand today as a sinner. I stand today as holy, righteous, and redeemed. I don't have to worry about my past. I don't have to worry about what was. I know what is. That's why He's the great I am. I wasn't. I wasn't good enough. I never will be good enough. I wasn't talented enough. I wasn't, but he is. He's talented enough for me. It comes through me like a like conduit. It flows through me. It's not my blessing, my talent, or my ability. I just put my hands in his. And I said, God, if you can use me, here I am. If you can pour anything good through this vessel, I'm here. God, you can pull it back. You can do with me great things, God, because you are a great God. And you got to get to the place where you stop singing that sad song of everything you never were or will be and start singing about who you are. You can lift your head up high this morning and be the child of God He wants you to be. You can do it. He says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Verse 4, i got to hurry. I cried to the Lord with my voice and He heard me out of His holy hill. Salah. There's that think and pause about it. Think about it again. I said, stop and think. You mean all I have to do is cry out to the Lord with my voice and He will hear. That's all He needs. That's all He needs to step onto the scene. That's all He needs. He doesn't need me to sow a $2,000 gift to prove in my life. He doesn't need me to sow that. No. All I have to do is call upon Jesus. All I've got to do is speak that name towards the heavens. I can do it with crying in my, uh, with tears streaming down my face. I can do it with laughter. I can whisper it. I can even think it in my mind and just say His name and He will come running to me. He will come running to you. All you've got to do is speak his name and ask he will come running from his holy hill you know what that means to me that means I don't have to worry about climbing up to where he is he will come down to where I am he's a God that doesn't mind getting on his hands and knees and working with me where I am I don't have to climb up to Him. I don't have to do anything to earn Him. He has loved me. He's put His love on me. He's put His love on you. And He's just wanting for that moment. If we could see the posture of the Lord right now in your situation, He's waiting at the edge of heaven saying, just call for help. Just call my name. I'm ready to run to you. I'm ready to go down where you are. I'm ready to pick you up and tell you it's going to be okay. Just Call out my name in faith believing. Jesus can help you. He longs to help you. He says, in verse 5, I laid me down and slept. I await for the Lord sustain me. Now, three verses ago, he's looking at the world saying, it's not fair. The odds are against me. There's people that tell me all my help is gone. And there's people telling me that my Lord won't work for me. There's people telling me that I'm nothing and I'm nobody. But then all of a sudden he starts to turn to the Lord and he begins to call out for help from the Lord. He begins to sing a different song about God. It's your barrier. It's your standard between me and it. It's your glory within me. You tell me who I am. You washed away. You washed away all of my problems. It's about you, God. And now... Instead of staying up all night worrying about his problems, he sleeps like a baby. When's the last time you laid your, de- your head down on your pillow without a worry in the world? 
say simply why? Not because the worries aren't there. Not because the circumstances have changed. Because something has changed in here. It says it doesn't matter. I'm going to sleep tonight. Why? Because God's got me in the palm of his hand. Because God has an expected end for me. God has a plan for me of peace and hope and not to harm me. God's got a purpose for me. He's brought me this far. He's not going to abandon me now. He's got me if I'll stand in faith, believe him. If I'll stand where I need to be, and my tune will be all day, God, I believe in you, and I believe in your word, and I'm going to stand in you. Then when I go to sleep tonight, I don't have to sit on my, on my bed and stay up half the night worrying about tomorrow and what it holds, or worrying about what is this going to happen, and what if that, and what if this doesn't come through, and what if that come, doesn't come through. Nope, I can simply put it in the hands of a God who loves me and say, good night, I'm done, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to be at peace. Guys, I mentioned it this morning in Sunday school. God tells us there's a peace that is available that passes understanding. God tells us there's a place where we can get in God where worry and fear and doubt don't have to play a part in who we are. Do you believe that? I believe that. With all of my heart, I believe there's a place we can get in God where I do not have to worry, doubt, and fear about anything. I heard a minister telling a story one time. And it, and it made me laugh, but I've always, it's always stuck with me. A minister, two different ministers from two different places, they went on like a vacation together. And they went on a vacation down to Florida. Uh, I can't remember where I heard the story. I wish I could tell you the minister that told it. I don't remember. But, but they went on this trip down to Florida together. He's like, and we were down there having a good time, and we're just going through, like, they were at a farmer's market, and they were just kind of going through and getting all the produce and all the fruit, and, and they were just kind of walking there. Well, one of the ministers gets a phone call, and he answers it. He says, hello. And he was like, oh, okay. Okay. All right. Bye. That was all. That's all the guy heard. And the guy's like, hey, what's going on? Everything okay? He's like, yeah, the church caught on fire. And burnt the whole east wing down to the ground. And the other minister was like, oh, my gosh, are we going to have to go home? Are we going to cut everything? And the minister just got a phone call. He's like, I think I want some grapes. And the other minister is just dumbfounded. He's like, well, do we need to do anything? No, nah, no, nah, I, I want some grapes. And I'm thinking about getting some oranges, you know, just going by his bed. And the other minister can't fathom it because he's thinking in his mind, if I heard my church had just caught on fire and half of it was on the ground burnt to ash, I would be flipping out. I would be like, oh my gosh, let's call the insurance. Oh my gosh, do everything like that. So the minister asked me, what are you doing? Why? <laughs> you, you're just going to let that roll off you or whatever? He was like, God built it. God built it in the first place. He knew the fire was coming. He'll build it again. Just kept going. Vacation, like nothing. You say, oh, well, that's just being irresponsible. No, that's standing in faith believing. Because what could that minister do? Because he would, with him running back and being at the church looking at the ashes, is it going to help build a new church? Nope. Nope. Is it going to be a good thing for his ministry, or for his ministry, for all of his uh, 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 laymen there to watch him and watch him panic? Oh, what are we going to do? Nope. The best thing they can see is, you know what? God's got us. God gave it to us. God takes away, but he can bring it right back. And I always stuck with me because I'm thinking, God, that's the way I want to be. I want to be able to stand in the worst of news and put a smile on my face and say, you know what? It's going to be all right. Why? Because God is faithful. God's faithful. Now, have you got there yet, Pastor? I'm working on it. I ain't got there completely, but I'm working on it. So I encourage you, work on it. Get to the place where you say, you know what? I'm going to let peace come to me because God's got me. And it's going to be all right. It's a different tune. He goes on and says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. The size of the enemy can be intimidating sometimes. The size of the circumstances. Because I know even while I'm preaching this, you've got thoughts going through your head. Yeah, Pastor, I know what you're saying. But if you knew what I was going through, if you knew the circumstances I was looking down the barrel at, 
If you knew what I was going through, it doesn't matter. I don't mean to make light of your plight. I don't mean to make light of your situation. I don't mean to mock it. That's not where I'm coming from. What I'm telling you is God is good enough and great enough to bring you through it. God is good enough and great enough, and, and if we'll put our faith in Him, God can bring you through it. How long will it take? I don't know. It may take a year. It may take five years. It may take ten years. I don't know. We wait upon the Lord. We renew our strength. He does His part. We put our faith in Him, and we let Him handle it. It's not It's not a 7-Eleven. It's not a convenience store. You don't go to heaven and, and browse in what heaven has, and be like, I take this, this, and this, and I need it tomorrow. That's not how this works. You put your faith in God. God is never late. God is always on time. God will always be there when you need Him most. God will never be like, oops, sorry, got busy, left you out there. Sorry, get you next time. That's not God. He's not like that. He will show up. If you put your faith in Him, He will make sure everything works out for your good. Amen? So don't get intimidated by the size of your enemy and how many things are coming against you. He prays this prayer, verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. I like the way David thinks and the Holy Spirit put him in to think. Because to me, one of my favorite boxers of all time was Mike Tyson. Everybody remember Mike Tyson? Crazy dude now. Got a tattoo on the side of his face. and Crazy. He was crazy when he was boxing. Yeah. Biting biting someone's ear, dude. Yeah. But I want you for a minute to not think about crazy Mike Tyson and think about Mike Tyson who knocked Spinks out in like 30 seconds. Think of the guy who came into the ring and before the match, even even before the match even started, you could tell the other guy was like, I'm going to die. Just don't hit me, just don't hit me, just don't hit me, don't, bam, done. Why? Because that dude would just simply knock you into next week. Mike Tyson to this day was not a technical boxer. They will tell you, people who, who analyze boxing, they say, you know what? He wasn't, he didn't know a lot of, he didn't move a lot. Of, all Mike Tyson had was this and this. That's it. Because if he didn't get you with this, he was going to get you with that. And if he got you with that, you were on the mat. Done. That's it. I loved watching him because I love seeing a good knockout. To this day, I, I love it. Bam! Woo! On the mat, drool everywhere. Love it. Love it. You say, man, Pastor, that's kind of morbid. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. Pow! Just see one sleep. It amazes me. You were awake 10 seconds ago and now you're asleep. That, that's awesome. I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want anybody to lose their life or nothing, but it's a sport. But here's the cool thing. When I think about this verse, what David has just said, what he sung in a song. This is a song, dude. This isn't, this isn't just, like just a rambling of some man. He's writing this as a song. He's saying, the Lord gets into the ring and cold cocks the devil right in the face and puts him on the mat to where he loses all of his teeth. That's a cool praise and worship song. That is a song that gets me run. That's better than the Rocky song, dude. That is better than all the boxing movies I've ever seen in my life. To think about when my, this is how your pastor thinks. When I think about God stepping into the ring of the devil, he's facing a, a foe that he's already knocked everything out of him. He's already put him on the mat. And he's toothless. Have you ever had grandmother, whatever, who had dentures? Amen? Amen? How many of you ever seen them take them out? And their face gets a weird look because there's no teeth there. So their lips kind of sink in a little bit. And all there is is gums. Don't worry. I'm heading that way soon. <laughs> Can't wait for the day I get dentures. Amen. At least it'll all be straight. <laughs> Amen. Can't wait. But I've never been afraid of getting bit by somebody that don't have the dentures in. 
Have you? No, why? Because all I can do is gum you. That's it. That's it. They can, they, can, they can put pressure and gum, but they can't do anything really. Guys, I know that's funny, but do you realize when, the, when God is looking at the devil, he's looking at a toothless devil. All he can do is gum you and slobber on you. He can't really do anything else. He can make you uncomfortable. He can try and scare you. But when it comes to the day, he's toothless. But yet, that's the devil we tremble at. How many of you got a demon story that you'd love to tell me? Oh, this one time this happened. Oh, this is the scariest thing ever. And it oh, sent me shivers and I still think about it and it keeps me up at night. That's a toothless devil that you're afraid of. It puts it in perspective. It puts us in perspective of when we look around and we see all the armies of hell set against us. But how funny would it look if we could actually look into the teeth of the devil and just see him there smiling with no teeth, just gums. That's it. That's the devil we fight. Because the, the Lord has literally rendered him powerless to the redeemed. Did you hear me? Rendered him powerless to the redeemed. Now he's got say so for the unredeemed. He's got benefits. He's got rights. But guess what? When we are in covered in the blood of Jesus, his rights end. He has none. He has no authority. He has no authority in my life. Why? Because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen? I love that verse. He says, you've punched him in his cheekbone and you've broken his teeth. That's awesome. Verse 8 sums it all up. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Salah. Did you hear that? Another pause and think about it a moment. Lexi, come and play. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. What does that mean? Salvation belongs to the Lord. I thought the salvation belongs to us. No. It's the possession of the Lord. That means the deciding factor isn't mine. Whether God saves me or not. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Him and His love towards me. And I can tell you, it is the will of the Father that everybody comes to repentance. And everybody comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ and everyone comes to the redeeming grace of the Lord. That is the will of the Father. Towards you, towards me, towards anybody else in the world. That is His will. When, God, when I say God saved me, I know it sounds in past tense. But I can tell you, He saves me every day. His salvation is still working today, just like it was back then. And I'm not trying to change doctrine, once saved, always saved. I'm not telling you all that. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you is, the same redeeming grace that held me the first day that I met Him is the same redeeming grace that works in my life right now, presently. It's the same redeeming grace. And if He saved me yesterday, He can save me today. If He saw me through Last year, He's going to see me through this year. If He saw me through the time when I thought I was going to lose it all, when, he, when I thought that, man, this is it, this is over, I'm done, this valley is going to get me, this giant's going to kill me. When He saw me through that, the same salvation that held me then is the same saving grace that I can step into today. Salvation is an everyday continuing thing. Everyday continuing thing. You're never going to find yourself in a circumstance that He can't save you from. Never. Even if you caused it, His love for you and His mercy is great enough if you simply call on His name. Help me, God. I blew it. I made a mistake. So dumb. I've prayed that prayer a million times. Lord, I blew that one. That was stupid. I knew it was stupid when I was doing it, and I shouldn't have done it. God, help me. Salvation is there because it belongs to Him. It's His to give. It's His. But this is something that He promises us. The last part of this. I want you to think about this. His blessing. His blessing is upon 
his people. His blessing. Not my blessing. Not what I can give. Not what I can do for Chad Kirk. Not what you can do for you. And what we can know that we can do for each other. No. His blessing. Is upon his people. And when I, when I get up in the morning. And when I do what I do. In the course of my day. In the middle of my problems. In the middle of my issues. One of the most sobering and comforting thoughts I can say. Is God. I belong to you. You have my heart. You have my life. The very breath I breathe is because you allow it. I belong to you, God. I'm a part of the kingdom of God. And because of that, I know your blessing is upon me in my life. Because I'm part of who you are. And I belong to you. James mentioned this earlier today. Spiritual blessing. I'm not talking about blessings that the world can give. The devil can give fame and fortune. The devil can give possessions and stuff and houses and and all that stuff. The devil, it's within his power to give you that. I'm talking about blessings that the world can't give. That's what I'm talking about. When he says his blessings are are upon me, we're talking about eternal things. Things that don't wither and fade. Things that stay with me the rest of my life. Things that will stay with you for the rest of your days. If you just... Sing a different tune. Sing a different song. Where does it start? It starts where verse 4 started. I cry unto the Lord with my voice. He comes down from His holy hill to help me. That's where we're at right now. What do you need help with this morning? What do you need? What are you dealing with? What are you struggling with? What, what army of hell is facing you right now? What circumstance is at your door that just won't let you go? What is it? Can I tell you the answer? Call out with your voice His name and watch Him come. Watch Him move. Put your faith in it and watch Him and it'll happen. Do you believe that this morning? you believe that? Then let's bow our heads and pray.